Okay. So Here it's preparing. So we're live on Facebook. Welcome to Yariksa. <laughs> to Hi, the co yeah. I'm so excited to have you on the Co-Creative Sex Dialogues. Um, I had the good fortune of meeting Yariksa last, last summer at the Hive Conference um, in California. And her vibrancy is what caught my attention. I was like, who's that sprite of joy? She was just like, all oh. of energy in this kind of conference room. And she was just like, this, this ball of happiness and joy and getting everyone happy. And I was just like, who is this? And turns out Aww. she's there to like, you know, bring movement and get everyone motivated and, and movement. And she's like the leader of this movement that I discovered called Unleash Movement. And she'll get a chance to explain all that to us. But uh, welcome, <laughs> welcome, welcome. And we're here to talk about a very juicy topic. And I, I saw one of her posts one day and she was like talking about sovereignty. And I was like, yes, we need to talk about sovereignty. So we're going to talk about body shame. It's in their kind of series of body shame, but sovereignty and sovereignty, as Yarixa is going to tell us too, is that it touches in so many different areas. So I know that you wanted to make sure that people were following is that everything set up for you on your page? Yeah. Yep. Let, me, let me check on my Facebook really quick. Um, let's see. Timeline review. Is that what I'm checking for? I think if I actually put it on, it, um, it, I hear two different sounds because I'm okay. streaming it both. So I'm just going to stay here yeah. on Zoom with you. That sounds good. That's good. And, That's good. and we're going to just let it ride. Yes. Let it be. Sounds awesome. <laughs> this will be shared. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah. So I think the first juicy question I wanted to say, well, first, maybe you can give us, I know you have a really interesting journey. Um, you're, you know, we call you Queen Bee of the Unleashed Movement. But, you know, maybe just give us a little bit like who you are and what you're up to in the world so they can just get a sense of who you are. Wow, cool. Oh, man, I'm um, my my highest excitement is to lead people into their personal freedom and truth, and to be a catalyst a passion igniter, you know, a provoker, so that people can go into their gifts, their talents and abilities and break through whatever stuff is blocking from an individual not being their true self. So I think my journey throughout just my entire life, just, you know, being born in Puerto Rico, um, living there until I was seven, Spanish being my first language, coming into the U.S., um, and then learning English, being in Tennessee from ages eight through 12, and that created a lot of who I am today and why I do Unleash and why I help people break free is because I experienced a lot of suppression through bullying, through racism, and I became so dim and my light became so dim that it was almost as if it wasn't myself anymore. Because mm. I used to be this bright, shiny little kid when I was in Puerto Rico. And, oh, I just had so many friends. And then all of that just kind of mm. disappeared. Wow. And, um, and I became so shy and introverted mm. that I couldn't even look at people in their eyes. Wow. And, um, and it wasn't until like my sophomore year in high school that these two amazing boys in my math class said to me, Yadi, why do you look down at the floor when you're talking to us? You know, that's a sign of insecurity, right? And I was like, I don't know. And I looked down at the floor again. And, and then they're like, wait, okay, don't look down at the floor. We're going to help you. And we're going to, we're going to teach you. Yeah. We're going to teach you how to look at us into, in our eyes when you're talking to us. And so for I practiced hearts. with them. I know for like three days. Oh. And I literally, that was, that was one of the first breakthroughs of um, actually starting to come out of my shell. And the reason I looked down was because I was wanting to hide. I didn't want to be seen. Mm. Um, I felt so insecure. I felt ugly because that's what I you know, it was told growing up. Yeah. Um, it, and so like, you know, those beliefs just stayed stuck in me. Um, so I had to really, and can I just add like a little thing, it. like before you go and sure. cause like, cause it just, just, just kind of like a little aha moment went up in my head because yeah. 
one thing I like when I see you, like I see this spectacularly beautiful woman that's like no has no shame of her body. She's like going almost naked everywhere, you know, just <laughs> gorgeously fit and um and, and like having fun with like costume and just being super self-expressed. But I always, you know, sometimes like some some people that like, you know, they can be very out in the world. They can also have a bit of an arrogance about them. And I never, never felt that about you. And I was like, wow, there's mm. such kindness that comes from this mm. woman. And and it's it, it doesn't surprise me when you share the story about those boys, like look at us in the eye, because that was pure kindness giving you permission mm. to step in. And I just think that's very interesting. Mm. Thank you so much. Yeah. Thank you for, for sharing that reflection. And I, yeah, I think, I think why arrogance didn't kick in for me was because I, I, I understand what it's like to um, be inside of my shell and um, be highly insecure and relate to a lot of people. Mm -hmm. And it was more like, I feel like for me, it comes from within. So it's a level of confidence versus arrogance. Mm, um, it's like, that's a I, good distinction. Yes. And it's like to know who you are from within allows that light to radiate outwardly without it feeling like you're overcompensating for something. Mm. Right. And I think a lot of the times, you know, when there is arrogance, um, I think that. Uh, there's there's an overcompensation and maybe something similar occurred, but there's the work that you actually have to do to transform it and transmute it into confidence, not mm. arrogance. That is so good. Wow. <laughs> yeah. So yeah. so what what would that transmuting look like of taking uh, something that could be arrogance and bringing it into confidence? Right. So so. You know, I personally went through a journey of, okay, well, my next step after these boys was I'm going to enter into a fitness competition because I feel like I can win. <laughs> and there was, there was a, there was a arrogance at that time about me because of the insecurity that I felt. And so I went into it to prove myself, mm. right? Look at me. I'm strong. I'm, mm -hmm. you know, look at my body. And it also turned into um, a way of me utilizing my body and sex to feel worthy. Mm. And so when I got that attention, it started to fill the void. But it was a false. Uh, it was a. It's. It, it, it was. It was a falseness around the security that I felt because if that wasn't there, I would be insecure. Right. So I had to undergo a process of, um, okay, I got the body and now I feel more miserable. Why do I have the body and feel more miserable? And that was the trajectory into my spiritual awakening. Mm. Because as I went into my body, I'm like, oh, now I feel more closed. Um, I now have to keep up this body in order for me to feel secure within myself. And if I don't work out, like the next day after I ate a cookie, it was like, a big deal because then I would feel like, Oh no, like I'm going to get an ounce of cellulite and that's going to be like, then mm. I'm not going to be as attractive. Mm. And so I then, you know, because it became, I started to experience a lot of health issues as well, digestive issues. Um, and that started to point me and like, okay, this can't be right because if I'm looking this good and my health is suffering and my relationships are suffering there, there's something off about this picture. And I think oftentimes we think like when we get the thing, we're going to be happy. Mm -hmm. right. But the thing is there to show you then afterward, like once you, you know, do have that sense of accomplishment, if you will, you're going to just come to terms of like, wait. And so you start doing some self inquiry mm -hmm. of like, what's going on here? Like what healthy for me, not what is healthy. And I went through a, just a big process of relationships and being hurt. And then I went to, uh, finally I got into meditation and I also got into, um, 
all the healing modalities that you could just possibly think of. And then I went into plant medicine. I did ayahuasca when I was like 28 years old. So I read a lot of books for five years on personal development. I needed to understand what it was that was going on inside of me because Mm -hmm. things weren't matching up. Um, And so, yeah, that's a good flag, a good flag. Things are not matching up here. It's a red flag. Yeah, things, yeah, it's a red flag. I look good, but I'm not happy. The body didn't get me my happiness. There's something off here. And um, and then that leads into, of course, like after doing that type of work for so long, where I also coach people to lose weight. And I, you know, I've been a health and fitness in the health and, uh, health and wellness field for almost 19 years now, since I was 19 years old. And I did a couple of um, uh, television shows and one for MTV, one for TLC to help people do this from an intrinsic way, not an exterior way like I did it, right? So I had right. to undergo that. And um, and then I still felt sort of trapped in my body. I still was like, hmm. I felt so structured and routine still right. that it was like, there's more. Okay, yes. I've broken through these things, but there's hmm. more. And I kept going towards the fears. Because I think going towards your fear is super important in gaining a lot of level of freedom, and also yeah. going towards your highest joy. It's both things are going to yeah. lead you mm. to your freedom. I love that fear and joy, leaning into those two things. Leaning, <laughs> lean into both. Yeah, lean into both. Yeah, it's so beautiful. Like you're like, okay, first you get the body, then you're like, okay, this is not it. But then you go and you do like the corporate, not the corporate, but like the more mainstream thing of like being on TV, doing all these things that like, you know, again, would be another checkbox to be of, 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 of like you know, celebrity status kind of thing. And then you're like, hmm, still not really getting what I want. <laughs> and I have to do a little bit of self-inquiry. And then it sort of brings you down this route of, of get, connecting to what are actually the fears that I'm avoiding and where my actual joy? Because like these yeah. other things that seem to be the bling bling, we're just not fulfilling it. And, and, here, and here's just another one. is like I got married to my quote dream man um, and we were together for seven years and married for two and a half years. He fits all of the things, all of the qualities, like the resume was there. And I kept looking at the resume, but I'm like, but he checked all of these off. Why am I still unhappy? Mm. Um, And, you know, it's really about I wasn't listening to the experience that I was actually having to Mm. our actual dynamic. Mm. And it wasn't actually fitting who I was as a person. Mm -hmm. And I was discovering myself as a person because I was programmed to believe, you know, like from my culture, like monogamy, um, get married have kids, uh, you know, do this type of job, uh, you know, go to college, like from my dad, this is what success looks like, this amount of money equals that you're successful, you're not successful if you don't have that kind of money in your bank account. And so it's like taking a look at all of the programming, and literally, literally just start erasing interrupting all of it. It's like, is that really true? Yeah. What was the what was your checklist for your ideal man? Oh man, I don't know. It was 62 qualities. It was like, <laughs> it was, <laughs> yeah, it was like honest, kind, good hearted, um, you know, beautiful body, uh, light eyes, six foot, perfect penis, whatever, you know, like <laughs> all the things that you could possibly list, I listed. And he definitely fit uh, 61 out of the 62. He was, uh, the 62nd one, I think, was more having him being sovereign in his being. Mm-hmm. But at the same time, he couldn't have been because I wasn't. Right. And so it was a perfect match yeah. to lead me into my sovereignty and understanding who I am as a person. Yeah. So just um, because this is like the heart. Yeah. Yeah. Since this is the real big hot topic of our conversation what does sovereignty mean for you? Like, cause it's, it's, mm-hmm. you know, for many people, it's a very abstract thing. And when you've tasted yes. it and experienced it, it totally makes sense. But so many people don't have an experience of sovereignty. They don't have an experience right. of the inner sovereignty. They might have an idea of political sovereignty, but they right. don't, they don't have, they don't always know what to, how to navigate this if they don't have, they haven't tasted it. So what does it taste like from the inside sovereignty? Okay. 
you know, I've gotten many glimpses of it because I can't say that at all given moments in time am I feeling like a sovereign being. There's moments of forgetfulness as uh, in this human experience, and it's a journey. It's like, you know, you think, you know, you're never there. You're, you're always in movement and in flow. Mm -hmm. And so for me, what I experience sovereignty as is owning who you are in your God mm. self. Mm -hmm. Right, that that you are an embodiment, like an actual embodiment yes. of God yes. in your unique form, and there's nobody else like you. We're all equal, but there's nobody else like you. It's like different and equal mm -hmm. is the importance here because we're the puzzle pieces to each other, and so when we can claim who we are in our highest self, meaning the sense of separation, the sense of all the illusion, of all of the program, you dismantle them and claim your own truth. Like, just to give an example, if you've been living a life of, um, you know, going to college and you got this job, but you're feeling unhappy with that, um, it's to actually question that because there's something in there that's not matching who you really are or your passion or your dream. Um, there's something off in there. Or even let's say you are a monogamous person because that's what you've seen all your life growing up and your parents were that and your environments held that space. And that's what you were taught maybe even culturally, religiously, um, and you're always aiming for and then that. and then you're like and then you're always like you know thinking and why is it not working that you want to be with a bunch of other people <laughs> then it's like you have to acknowledge that that is there and not ignore it and not mm. sweep it under the rug right like how do you find your personal truth is like what are those beliefs that are trying to come in but you keep like pr pressing them down and shoving them down as if they don't exist Mm -hmm. Right, and so it's like, how can we find our true self in in all of the things that our relationships, our work, um, and and how is your joy level? I think is really important to acknowledge because if you're yeah. feeling for the majority of the part, like even if you're going through some shitty stuff, that you still have this feeling of, well, it doesn't matter, but at least. I'm doing everything that I want, yeah. you know, and knowing yourself as a creator. Right. That's a very strong idea. Knowing yourself as a creator. <laughs> um, when you were in your relationship and you're like, he meeting the 61 things, but it's still, I'm not happy. And I've done all these really great gigs and yet I'm still feeling contrived. What, what was the, ex how do you get to that feeling of like God, given experience that you just described, like, what was that peer, like, what was that process of like, wow, like, this is really okay. what I need to be doing? Well, you know, it's interesting. So for me and my particular relationship, um, I lost all sense of sexual desire. I felt like there's something wrong with my hormones. And my ex-husband was hot. He was like such a beautiful man. He was good hearted. And I couldn't get turned on for the life of me. And part of that um, was because we were in such routines and just doing what we should be doing um, mm -hmm. and following suit and not really acting on the things that we truly desire that comes from creation from that first place. And mm -hmm. we kept stopping ourselves from doing it. And I kind of, I've, I've definitely, I've always been a go-getter, but he wasn't in that place that I was. So I had to like, I had to almost like step back and, and make sure he's okay. So like it was, it was a, it was a heaviness for me to carry because I, I was holding myself back due to where he was in his life because he met all of the qualities and the resume. Mm -hmm. So then what ended up happening for me was like, at one point I went out, I hadn't gone out dancing in a really long time. And uh, dancing for me, even though I didn't do it often and I didn't grow up dancing, but once I, I took on salsa, it was a, like a love. I was like, oh my gosh, this is so amazing. And I didn't dance for three years because he thought like I danced too professionally. 
And so he didn't want to be seen with me or he didn't want to go with me. And so then I sort of did whatever he wanted to do instead of filling mm. my own cup of what I, right. I really, what filled my soul. Yeah. I just was doing everything to fill his and, or ours, you know, to create a safe relationship, you know, um, to make sure that everything stayed okay. And so when I went dancing after, I was just like, okay, I need to go. And I lived at the time on, uh, in Santa Monica near the promenade, and they had street dancing. And so I went, and I danced, and I felt my soul. And then when I got back home, I just felt this feeling. And I even told him, like, like I just was so mad. I was so resentful. And it wasn't even at him. It was at myself, hmm. right? It's like, because I'm, the, even though that at the beginning of for sure there was a little bit of blame onto him, you know, after reflecting and all of that, it's really resentment on ourselves that we feel because we're not acting, we're not doing who we really are. We're mm. trying to people please. Mm. And the people pleasing shit does not get you anywhere. Mm-hmm. You have to like, there. yes, there's, there's such things as compromise in relationships. It's like, hey, I love you, so I'm going to try and meet you here mm-hmm. and meet you here, sure. But um, when it comes to sacrificing your soul, yeah. fuck no. Yeah. So I, um, I ended up having a dream about dolphins. And, like I, put, I, like, I saw my friend, like, two days later say, if you've ever had a dream about dolphins or swimming with the dolphins, come out to Hawaii. This is what I do. So I literally went to Hawaii, and I swam with the dolphins. And that was my my probably largest awakening from uh, mm. breaking that relationship and, and evolving from that relationship. Almost and like I this experience met, of like of yes. being in the wild and like being with nature and this yes. kind of freedom. Freedom. Um, and, and to be in the frequency of love because dolphins have a frequency of pure love. Mm. And they're also non-monogamous. And they're also <laughs> just sharing love. And you would see them with one partner and then the other. And it was just like this freedom and this just, and they just, there's just love and there's nothing that you could do wrong. And then, so it's like, there's such a sense of forgiveness of myself when I was in that experience that I released a lot and I released, like, I don't think it's good that I continue to stay in this relationship. And I ended up breaking it off and I ended up meeting somebody um, there as well. And funny enough, um, when I thought my hormones, you know, were like, you know, I thought it was a medical issue. All of a sudden, my, I was turned on out of, you know, and so like, that's really what was so telling for me. I'm like, wait, my body is fully responding right now. Like, whoa. And that's how I knew. And mm. so, you know, like you're I really awake. Body, yeah. Re- yeah, it's very embodied. And I think to listen to those keys, that your body, the messages that your body is trying to give to you because that's the gift of the body, right? It's your vehicle and it's your messenger. Yeah. So you talked about like, there's two things you have to kind of lean into is the fear and the joy. That these are really good indicators of things to like, like guide you. So give us an example of you leading into like some, some fear aspects that you felt like you had to like lean into. Um, well, let's see. I've had a fear of public speaking. I've had a fear of singing. I've had a fear of dancing. Um, uh, I've leaned into all of them. And trust me, like I went to a, a like I went to a course that it was about like public speaking, and um, I attended. It and I remember I was just sweating balls. It was just like my armpit. Just seeing a speaker speak, because there's something inside of me that was like so scared because that's where my power was. And I knew that I could be a really powerful speaker and I was deathly afraid of it Mm. because I was afraid to be made fun of. I was afraid to be rejected. I was afraid um, of looking stupid. I was afraid of not saying the right thing. I was afraid of not being intelligent enough, um, not good enough, um, not vibrant enough. And and, and all of that came from the childhood stuff, right? Like the being bullied and rejected and racism and all of that started to come to the surface yeah. but I kept leaning into it and I remember when the instructor or the facilitator of that particular experience said okay whoever wants to come up and get laser coached come up to the you know uh, raise your hand and I'll call on you 
and there's maybe 250 people in the room. And I remember I just was so committed to freeing myself Mm. that I literally jumped up with two hands (laughs) scared shitless because that was one of my biggest fears. And I'm like, okay, like, and he literally, like, he couldn't help but to call on me because it was just so, like, in your face. Um, And I was laser coach, and it was a really interesting experience for me because um, there was one moment in time where he held me down physically, and I remember um, trying to come up from the holding down, from that feeling of depression very physically and experientially that I just bawled in front of the entire room wow. in front of 250 people and, and then transparently communicated what was going on for me. Mm, and transparent wow. communication is freedom because that state of vulnerability is the most courageous thing that you can do in the entire world. So true. It's like, here I am and I'm showing you all of me. Yeah. And this nakedness. Yeah. And uh, I feel like the more vulnerable we can be, any time that we can lean into a state of transparency, vulnerability, for us to... It's like we reclaim a part of ourselves. Yes, it's like reclaiming a part of ourselves. Because what we're afraid that could happen, right? Like the pain that we think we're about to experience. Yeah. It's just smoke and mirrors. It's just smoke and mirrors. It's just like... Like, okay, it's uncomfortable and I don't want to go there and this is my comfort zone. I'm just going to be right here. Yeah. But then you feel worse. Yeah. You feel worse when you stay there because you die you, a little bit. You die. Yeah. You're fucking, you just die inside. Yeah. yeah. And that was going on for me for a long time until I couldn't take it anymore. Yeah. And well, when you, when you describe that, dancing. yeah. Yeah. Just before we jump to the dancing, yeah. Um, yeah. as you're speaking, I was getting this image of like, it's almost like there's this like, like, piece of plastic and you start pushing on it and it starts stretching and then you push and push and you feel held back but at one point it pops and you're like free up you know yes and it's like wow you're like oh like I'm actually free like I can actually like be outspoken I can be actually in front of people and I'm all right and like yeah it's like a breath it's like an exhale it's like a it's like a deep breath yeah, wow, that's a, you know, that must have been a really powerful moment to be on stage bawling and like, and he seemed to like really targeted different things to have a reaction in you to like allow oh, yeah. you to get to this place of authenticity, right? Yeah, that's totally. what he was trying to do. Yeah, well, because one of the things that to get me on stage and laser coach me was to also have me go on stage and in one minute sell whatever it is that I'm supposed to be selling, like to share a story in one minute and have people raise their hands that they want to work with me on top of it all. So it's just like when I did that and there was like 10 people out of 250 that responded, the level of contraction and rejection and all the things that I'm thinking that people are, I'm projecting out onto what they're thinking of me Mm. was that was the, the devastating thing. And that's when afterward he like, okay, cool, that happened. He goes, okay, cool, now we're going to do this exercise. And so then that's when he pressed me down. And then after I bawled in front of everybody and I redid mm-hmm. my minute, I think it was like 60-something people that raised their hand wow. to work with me. Yeah. And it was because they could finally relate to me. Right. Um, because I felt like I was, it, it was too perfect or too put together because right. I'm trying to hold it all together. When we try to hold it all together, it's like people can feel that and they can't connect. They can't feel your heart. They can't feel your soul. Mm. So the the work is to become a true sovereign being is to be in a full state of surrender, vulnerability, go towards your fear and go towards your joy. Yeah. So like you seem that you've really exercised this muscle now, like you're actually guiding people through all these different things. Um, like what allowed you to become a masterful person to go into these difficult spaces? I think I do it almost on a daily basis. It's a daily practice for me. It's a like, anytime I feel my body 
constricting mm. with anything. Mm. I go into a self-inquiry. I'm like, wait, what's that? And, um, you know, when I say on a daily, it could be six days out of the seven. But like, um, but pretty much anything that I find myself that I'm not fully being authentic in or there's a fear there or there's a belief there that's creating me to contract, that means that there might be a judgment, right? So I'm, I'm removing all of the fears, which is, you know, like lack, doubt, um, miserliness, um, just a poverty state of mind, um, ignorance yeah. even, yeah. um, any, any of the fears that, that you can think of, I just go towards every single time and yeah. it's been a long journey and it's been a long process. So yeah. I didn't get here today being naked on stage because now I pretty much, you know, even at Unleash, I've been topless, um, and it's not coming from a place of like, oh, I'm I'm trying to be something. I'm trying to be no. unleashed. No. no, it's that I actually really. am that. And yeah. so that's what I just happen to do naturally. And yeah. because there's no thing around it, like yeah. I don't have any shame. There's no shame of my body. There's no shame of nakedness. There's no shame or judgment. Um, then people experience that with me and they lose their shame and mm. they lose their judgment because mm. they're experiencing such a level of joy that truly comes from within. Yeah. And um, yeah, it's just, it's a leaning into every time. And I'll just share really quickly, um, you know, how I got to unleash because I think a lot of people see me and they, they see me dance and they're like, Whoa, this girl must've, you know, she's been, been born like that. <laughs> born. She's, born like I mean truly my soul was born born like that right but I've yeah, suppressed it exactly and and that's what we tend to do um because you know and dance in particular is really interesting a lot of people have a fear of like you know looking silly or stupid or um they don't know how to do a right dance move um they're afraid of the what people are going to think of them ultimately. Well, it's so vulnerable so, moving and communicating it, it, with your body. It's it's right. It's so vulnerable. If you feel awkward, you can see it right away. And it's like then you have to live totally. with that. <laughs> totally. And so like what what I ended up doing was hi. Um what I ended up doing was leaning into that because I I could feel myself like even though I took 10 salsa lessons when I was like 24 and that was like the sort of the foundation of what started um, this this spark and activation in me it mm. wasn't until only three years ago that I was fully activated and it was a moment in time when I went into a ceremony space with some of my friends and I just remember being and like listening to this music when we were in a deep ceremony state and um we, we took some psilocybin and, and I remember just my soul just wanting and I could feel the contraction in me because I didn't even want my friends to see me because mm. I had held that in for so long. Yeah. And then, and there was finally, a risk, a literal was, risk from like was, your high school it, years, you know? Yeah. Exactly. And so, and, and, and what, what ended up happening is that I just couldn't, my soul couldn't take it anymore. And so I just ripped it. I yeah. just started dancing like like I knew how to dance, like this tribal, like yeah. almost like an African um, woman that just knew how to dance. Yeah. And um, and it just came through me. And it was, wow. it was like, and I started screaming, full liberation. And it was just like this moment. Yeah. And that was the beginning process because that was only in front of like four people. And then it's, then I did it at a party where I just started to dance like that because now as I have the embodiment of it and I, and I got a taste of what it feels like, then I, I leaned into it further. And now I'm leaning yeah. into, you know, now being in a group of like a hundred people. And then I went to Burning Man and then at Burning Man, that was the moment when it was just falling onto my knees yeah. because I danced with this man that um, my friend was looking at me and we are dancing together. And it just felt like I, we had been performing for like 20 years because that's how much freedom I was able to 
access in my dance right. and and allowing myself to be surrendered with him. Wow. And um, she says to me after we stopped, and it was almost surreal, and I remember just being like, whoa. She's like, Yari, you have to do this for work, and holy shit. And, whoa, like you're going to be in my music video. <laughs> and I was like, and it was just like, oh, my God, I know. Oh, my God, I know. And, like, it was this, just this freedom that I felt that was, I was longing to experience because I, I could feel that ever since I was little that yeah. wanted to come through and I just didn't allow it. Well, it's almost like this really second. great power that you had and you just, it, it just, it was so strong and it's like you had to like bring it small and make everyone feel comfortable around you. At one point you're just like, I can't hold this water anymore. It's like, <laughs> yes, yes, because right. The, the, the other thought process and probably why I did that is because that, the, and I think a lot of people can um, maybe experience this either not enoughness, right. Yeah. And we can yeah. experience both simultaneously or yeah. too much. Yeah. We can experience both at the same time. Yeah. Um, and for yes. me, there's definitely a, oh no, this is going to be too much. This is going to be too sexy. This is too provocative. This is like, this is inappropriate. Oh, yes. um, and so I had to dismantle and said, fuck it to all of it. Yeah. And I allowed myself and that was it. And then the fear is gone and people actually get inspired by me. There's very few people that actually are like, whoa, like they yeah. actually just feel in so much joy and activated watching. And of course there's going to be a few people that may feel um, judgmental, but that's because they have to do their own work. They're only judging me because they're judging themselves. That's yeah. always how it works. Yeah. I'm not doing anything wrong. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, and we had a little quick conversation before talking, talking about another topic, but you did mention the word jealousy. So do people sometimes mm. look at you in this kind of completely unleashed and beautiful state of grace? Um, do they, is there like that comparison happening? I think, um, you know, I think I've, I've seen a little bit of that and I, and, and when I have witnessed it, and this is what I'm talking about, lean into the fear. Yeah. Um, when I have witnessed it, I continue to be big and that's fearful because there's yes. a part of me that wants to make people feel comfortable. comfortable. There's a, there's a part of me that wants to make people feel good. There's a part of me that wants to make people not feel less than me. But if I don't show all of myself, and this is what it is to be a sovereign being, if I don't show all of me, mm -hmm. then I am doing a disservice to myself, first and foremost, because I am dying. There's a little part of me that's dying, mm -hmm. and I'm doing a disservice to the world mm -hmm. because I am able to be the possibility for them mm -hmm. of what it could look like. Mm -hmm. So for me, I'm more committed to that mm -hmm. than whatever insecurity that might come up for me mm -hmm. or, or whatever, whatever belief that makes me smaller, I will look at it and then I will sit in that and I will continue to be yeah. authentic to me. Yeah. What was the biggest part that you had to lean into around your body? Like, and it could be a situation like this where you're like, I'm still going to stay big, but like giving us like a. What, what, was, what was that biggest edge that you had to, like, or the biggest piece you had to lean into for the body to, to keep on respecting that, that, what was coming through for you? It's just, you know, I think, I think it's more of, I continue to follow the feeling, mm -hmm. the feeling of what it feels like to be in this body and being able, the ability to move like I move. Mm -hmm. It's just like, whoa, what a gift. So it's an embrace of that gift mm. that um, has continued to allow me because a lot of my movements, I almost feel like one with God. This is where I actually feel the, like a sovereign being is actually in my dance when I lose myself inside myself when I dance because it's a full embodiment. It's not to do it for and it's not to do it to get something it's because i'm feeling myself right mm -hmm. when, you, when you when you talk about like when you feel yourself mm -hmm. right that 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 sensation of like wow like oh my 
God, what a freaking gift this is. Mm. And, and the way that we can get to that place of experiencing that level of aliveness, because that's life force, right? That's what we yes. call a life force, is to continue to lean into the fear yeah. and the joy consistently, yeah. consistently. And again, I can't say that I felt like this five years ago because I didn't. Yeah. I, yeah. I, you know, so it's, it's, it's constantly peeling off the layers, constantly peeling off the layers, yeah. you know, and, and I think right before this, we were also talking about like relationships and stuff. So yeah. that's another big layer to peel back. Exactly. So, yeah. So what's the biggest edge that you're feeling right there right now? What, what are you leaning into? That's alive for you. Okay. So right now what's alive <laughs> for me <laughs> is, is uh, I'm currently in an open relationship with a woman and I have had experiences with women since uh, like maybe since I was about 24 years old. Um, I never really spoke about it um, at the beginning when that first occurred for me, when I even was a, went, when I actually went for it. Um, I had an, a full on panic attack hmm. because my, my, the upbringing that I came from is, you know, like very cultural, you know, I'm Puerto Rican. And so like it's, it's marriage and, and my mom also, I remember her saying, and bless my mom, she's a beautiful being and I love her dearly. And she has had some programming just like, you know, uh, other generations. Everyone else. <laughs> yeah, it's just like everyone else. And so forgiveness, compassion, the whole thing. But one thing that she did say when I was younger, she's like, oh my God, it will gross. These two women are kissing. Isn't that gross? And so that was an imprint mm. that I received as that's growth. And so therefore, when there were parts of me that were attracted, I would push it down. And then I started to make them gross too. Mm. I started to believe that it's gross. Mm -hmm. And so I um, suppressed myself up until I was 24 years old. And I think we lost you. This one was getting really juicy. <laughs> Let me see. <clears throat> see if she comes back. We lost her. Okay, well, we have to do a second part like we did with Davey the other day. So one second, we'll get this all sorted. We'll get back on. We don't want to leave you on the edge like this. <laughs> Talk to you in a minute. 